we have done fantastically well in the last five to ten years with improving immunisation coverage for our infants and in particular getting the first immunisation events on time. We're now at nearly 90% of our children getting immunised on time, and that's up with some of the world best statistics. But however, we still have a gap for those last 5 to 10% of our children, and we can do better to try and get our kids immunised on time, particularly to protect them against whooping cough and pneumococcal disease. We know that most parents in New Zealand want their children immunised and generally feel vaccines are safe, but have a range of concerns around vaccination. We also know that it's our communication skills in the general practice that will make the most difference, having a trusting relationship where we can share our knowledge and confidence with our parents. It sounds quite minor that children uh, may have their immunisation delayed because of a minor illness, but in fact the research shows this is actually the number one reason why children um, have their immunisations delayed and also don't go on to complete the full course of immunisations. I've had another family that came in and the child was a young baby due for the 15 months immunisations and mum was quite worried. She said, oh, the child has got diarrhoea and they're unwell. I don't think we should go ahead and immunise. We went through the importance of immunising, side effects, contraindications and she ended up learning that diarrhoea is not one of them, and the child did need the immunisations. Parents should be reassured if their child has got a minor illness, firstly it is a minor illness, um, secondly the immunisation will not make that illness worse, and thirdly that the uh, immunisation actually boosts the immune system uh, rather than runs it down. So when would we choose to delay giving an infant their vaccination? Well really for me it's when they're systemically unwell with a high fever, I would then choose to delay. However, that's pretty unusual in general practice. Most of the time we see children with mild illnesses, tummy bugs, sore ears, on antibiotics, asthma, recovering from infections, general snuffles. All of these children we can vaccinate and vaccinate confidently. Preterm infants are a particularly important group not to forget. In fact, around 7-10% to 10 of all our newborn infants are preterm. Many of these have higher health needs and are at higher risk of vaccine-preventable disease. Despite the concerns that they seem very young and very small, it is vital in this group to vaccinate them every time on time. It might be a common thing that GPs would have parents whose babies are a few weeks prem and um, the parents are concerned about the immunisation and wanting to, to delay it. What I'd ask GPs to do is reassure the families, first of all, that there's no increased risk of side effects, irrespective of gestation or low birth weight. Secondly, the baby's going to mount an effective immune response. And the other really important point is that preterm babies are more at risk of vaccine-preventable disease. As a general rule, we try to avoid drugs, including vaccines and pregnancy, but there are some situations where it's a good thing for them to consider. The first is influenza. Pregnant women are more at risk of influenza severity and complications, and we, we saw that with the H1N1 epidemic where we saw pregnant women dying. The other thing we're most concerned about is pregnant women acquiring pertussis themselves and then passing it on to their newborn babies so the pertussis booster will protect against that. We now have very good evidence of the importance of immunisation both for influenza and pertussis in pregnancy, not just for the mother but also offering passive protection to the infant prior to them being able to receive their primary immunisation course. Often we get parents who come in with their children and they're, they're concerned about the number of vaccines that we administer in one day. And they, they ask whether these vaccines can be split and given on separate days. Now we tend to reassure them that the human body on a daily basis is exposed to thousands of bacteria and viruses and is able to cope well, including the little children. The immune system has an unlimited capacity to take in everything. It's not biologically feasible that the immune system can be overloaded. It just can't be done. When babies are born, the moment they come out of the womb, everything they come across is new. And the immune system really is this magical system 
that allows um, humans to determine what is something that is good and what is something that is bad. And that happens the instant you're born. We can now be very confident about the ability of the infant immune system to respond to vaccines. In fact, it's been predicted an infant could respond to up to 10,000 vaccines. So the current amount of protein in vaccines is a drop in the ocean for what an infant's immune system is exposed to day in, day out from the moment they're born. Despite a range of populist concerns, there is no link between vaccines and significant allergic conditions. There is no link with asthma, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, eczema. And we now have very large international databases that have looked at many of these hypotheses, such as the American data linking, the large studies in Europe, that have often checked many of the hypotheses and not been able to show any link whatsoever. The previous concerns about immunisation was that by giving them something, you will create an allergy. But it's actually the opposite is actually the case. If you want to stop an allergy, there are sensitisation treatments and they're common in things like bee venom. And the way you treat it is actually by giving them the protein. So it doesn't make any immunological sense. Contraindications which people often get a little bit confused about, particularly with the MMR vaccine, is the egg allergy. It has been thought that the uh, MMR vaccine is actually produced in an egg. It isn't. It's produced in a chicken embryo, um, which is where people get confused. And any sort of egg allergy is definitely not a contraindication to having the MMR vaccine. It's important to make the point that pneumococcal disease is very widespread in childhood. It affects all children, irrespective of a decile rating. We know in other countries where you've got good pneumococcal vaccine coverage, you drop your respiratory child hospitalisations by 30%. So we're expecting to see a reduction in pneumonia. The other really important thing we worry about in paediatrics is invasive pneumococcal disease, um, bacteremia, septicemia, and particularly meningitis. Pneumococcal meningitis is very severe, 5% mortality lots of complications in survivors, so if we can prevent it with this vaccine, it's um, very important. At times, people get confused about the pneumococcal vaccine. They may confuse it with other meningitis vaccines, the men's B, and assume they don't need it. The importance here is communicating with our families that this is a vaccine not just for meningitis, but also particularly against a reduction in pneumonia. So in summary, we have very few reasons to delay immunising our infants. The most important one not to miss would be anaphylaxis to any component in a vaccine. This is incredibly rare, but worth looking out for. Remember that live attenuated vaccines should not be given to immunocompromised children, and particularly we remember the MMR vaccine and varicella. Live attenuated vaccines also should not be given to pregnant women. Other than that, if a child is systemically unwell with a high fever, we would want to delay the vaccination. If they had an evolving neurological condition, we'd want to delay until we knew what was going on. All in all, these are very rare reasons for delaying. On the whole, we should be able to vaccinate the majority of our children on time, confidently and sensitively with good communication with our parents.